right, good evening, everyone. I wanna thank you very much for being here. We are thrilled to be here for another Experts Next Door. And uh, Brookside Museum, home of the Saratoga County History Center, has been putting on these Experts Next Door programs uh, for quite a while now. And we are thrilled to have this as another uh, chapter in that series. I encourage you, if you are not already a member of the Saratoga County History Center, uh, to look into becoming one. We offer a lot of things, both on site at the museum, right in Ballston Spa, and uh, we also do a lot of online programs as well, as well, like we are doing this evening. And uh, that all of that information is available on our website. And you can find information there about becoming a member, becoming involved as a volunteer, and also information on upcoming events. And you can also follow us on Facebook and other social media platforms as well under Saratoga County History Center. And uh, again, we are very happy to be here this evening and uh, happy to have Dr. Maeve Kane with us. And she is here from SUNY Albany and she has been doing a fantastic amount of research on the Haudenosaunee people. And this is something, a topic that uh, at Brookside Museum is very important to us. Uh, we try to cover this with our children's programming. We have a program in the fall called Native New York uh, where we work with fourth grade level students Students. Uh, but it, it's also very interesting to cover this um, from an adult perspective and really dive deep into this topic. And we're very happy to have Dr. Kane here with us this evening so we can do that. So I'm going to turn it over uh, to Dr. Kane and she can do an introduction to herself and her background. Uh, but again, thank you everyone for being here. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Anne. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Well, I'm going to do two things. Uh, my slides are all online, and I'm dropping the link into the chat there if you'd like a direct link. Uh, and if you want to see any of those more closely, I'm going to share my screen so you can see these. Um, but if you want to, I have a few links to further resources and things like that uh, in the slides if you want to refer back to that in the future. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to get my stuff pinned so I can see what I'm actually looking at here while I talk to you. Um, so I'm Maeve Kane. I teach at UAlbany. Uh, I received my PhD from Cornell University, and my talk tonight is uh, coming from my first book. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the book itself towards the end of my talk today. Um, but my book covers three centuries of contact between uh, the Haudenosaunee and settlers, European settlers in what's now New York. Um, so I start in the very early period of contact in the 1600s, and I go through the 19th century. And the topic of tonight's talk, the revolution, is in many ways a turning point in both the scholarship and in the historical period. Um, but it's not a turning point in, uh, in the sense that it has often been figured. In the academic scholarship, often uh, the American Revolution is thought of as kind of a breaking point or an end point for indigenous history. Uh, and one of the arguments that I'm gonna make to you tonight is that that's not actually the case. Uh, indigenous sovereignty did not end with the revolution. Uh, before I begin tonight, I want to uh, just briefly thank Anne and everybody at Brookside for inviting me. Um, I also want to briefly acknowledge uh, in Saratoga County and in where I am in Schenectady County, I hope you don't hold that against me, um, we're on the lands of the Gnihigahaga Lodenoshone or Mohawk Iroquois, uh, as well as the Mahikinak Stockbridge Muncie. Um, and this a land acknowledgement kind of helps us think about where we are situated right now in the 21st century. Um, because what I'm going to be talking about tonight is the process by which that land became American land, uh, often through violence and through force. Um, so thinking about what this means and what the scholarship means in the present is very much part of my scholarship. Um, I also wanted to briefly let everybody know I'm going to be very, not graphically, but I will be touching on uh, sexual assault towards the end of today's talk. There will be a map and then I'll be talking about um, the, the place of sexual assault and rape of indigenous women during the, the revolution. So I just wanted to give folks a heads up on that. So much of what underlies our discussion of indigenous history um, is the, the question of sovereignty. Whose sovereignty, what is it? Um, the image that's up on the screen right now is a modern 21st century Haudenosaunee passport. 
sovereignty is the the right of a nation to exercise the powers of a nation uh the power to describe or to decide who's a citizen who belongs what laws apply within their own boundaries uh and the right of their citizens to travel safely in and out of that nation uh, and this is still very contentious in the 21st century uh Haudenosaunee people from many different reserves and reservations travel on Haudenosaunee passports as an as a demonstration of their sovereignty um but even now in 2023 uh teaching at UAlbany I have a lot of I'm not indigenous myself um I but I have a lot of indigenous students from the six nations um who travel on their Haudenosaunee passports who are members of the Haudenosaunee Nationals lacrosse team uh who still routinely get stranded in places um when traveling internationally on Haudenosaunee passports because they're not always recognized uh, by other governments. Um, most recently, the Haudenosaunee Nationals got stranded at the Newark, uh, New Jersey airport, which anybody who's ever been to New Jersey knows is one of the worst possible fates ever. Um, so this has serious consequences in the present. Uh, today, or this map is of 2020 Haudenosaunee territories, uh, but today in 2023, Haudenosaunee territories are uh, broken up. This is a process of the 18th and 19th century process of colonialism, of taking large contiguous indigenous territories and shrinking them into these much smaller reserves and reservations uh, that are broken apart from one another. And my talk tonight about the revolution is how that, start, that process started. Because in the 1700s, uh, up until really the American Revolution, what we now think of as New York State and parts of Southern Canada were indigenous territories. These were Haudenosaunee spaces. Um, in this map here, this is a map that I created for my first book. Um, I, I chose in the historical maps to mark all of these maps with their Haudenosaunee names, uh, the name of the St. Lawrence River, uh, Lake Ontario, et cetera, to really emphasize that until a very late date post-revolution, these were Haudenosaunee spaces. Um, where I am in Schenectady was really the western limit of white settlement in what's now New York. Um, there were a few white families in uh, Fort Hunter, Fort Stanwix, Oswego, uh, and then in kind of the forts of Fort Niagara and uh, uh, that line of forts out there. But really, white people, white settlers did not know what was out there. Um, and you see this expressed in uh, in the writing during the revolution, that when American soldiers enter these territories for the first time as a hostile force, it's really the first time that white settlers are seeing what those territories are. And that becomes really significant in how they think about that landscape uh, and how they even think about what the American Revolution is, like what it is for. So thinking about these edges of settlement, um, one of the ways that we know what these like interactions of uh, white and indigenous families were like along the fringes of Haudenosaunee territories is through clothing uh, and account books. Um, one, of the one of the communities that had the most uh, entanglement is what scholars call it between white settlers and indigenous people was Fort Hunter and Canajoharie, Canajoharie near what's now modern Canada Harry. Uh, this is a, an account book page from uh, an account book kept by Jealous Fonda, who is the ancestor of Jane Peter uh, and the other Fondas. Uh, and he's a, he was an Indian trader uh, at Fort Hunter. Uh, Old Fort Johnson has this account book now. And this is uh, an account book page of Sawistawa, a Seneca woman, traveled from what's near uh, modern Buffalo now all the way to Fort Hunter to make these purchases. Uh, and she traveled this way uh, many times per year. This is her uh, account page from 1764. Uh, and these account books are a little bit like uh, kind of itemized, um, itemized credit card receipts where it'll say what exactly was bought for how much and sometimes what for. Um, so we can see here that Sawistawa bought blanket, uh, shrouds, piece of gartering, a fine white shirt, a French blanket, et cetera. And you can kind of get an idea of what people's lives are like through the things that they buy. Not always a very direct look, uh, like if they were writing about their own lives, but especially for populations like working class white people or indigenous people who aren't leaving a lot of their own written records, it can give you a closer idea of like the kinds of decision making that they're making. 
Uh, and Fort Hunter and Canada Harry are particularly interesting in the history of the revolution. Uh, in the generation before the revolution, during the French and Indian War of the 1750s and 1760s, um, this area came under suspicion because of the between uh, indigenous people and Palatine Germans in particular. Um, the Palatines said that they were uh, brothers of the Oneida and would never be parted from them. And that's many of the families that are making up the communities in the years leading up to the revolution. I'm not sure who has their mic unmuted. I at least am getting some. Uh, oh, sorry. sorry about that. Um, so from, from Fonda's book, you can get this idea of what these communities were like and how they were interacting. Um, it, Fonda makes very, very brief notes. A lot of it is scratched out like this. There's pages upon pages of this scratched out like this. Um, but you can see these families working together. Um, in many cases, um, men, both indigenous men and white men are doing things like plowing fields together mending fences. Uh, people would do things like they perform labor, like mending fences for a neighbor and use that to pay down their debt with Fonda. Um, so somebody mends a fence for someone and then their neighbor pays back, pays down their credit account uh, for that labor. So people trading labor like that. Women did things like make soap together, traded peas, traded sewing. Uh, and these interactions are very intimate. Um, people are interacting on a daily basis. They're going to the same church together. Um, and people also got an idea of what other people's lives were like. One of the other things that uh, Fonda makes note of and other Indian traders in this region make note of is that white widows in these com communities uh, were often supported by sewing for the Indian trade. Um, so a woman who's widowed in one of these communities or even in the relatively larger city of Albany at the time um, the Albany over overseers of the poor at times uh, employed poor widows at sewing for the Indian trade. So making things that were specific uh, to, to sell as ready-made items to native people, like uh, specifically Indian leggings, not an item worn by white people, shirts specifically for the Indian trade, uh, coats made for indigenous men, and uh, 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 other items that are specifically very indigenous. They're not selling for a white market in this. So it's through these kinds of things that people get an idea of like what other people's lives are like, the significance of those choices. Uh, and as a historian, I can also get an idea of what kind of choices people are making in this through the kinds of things that they're buying. Um, so Fonda, his customers were both white and indigenous. So Wista is one of, one of the indigenous customers, but he also had about half of his customers were, um, were white people. And there's very, very distinct differences in what these people are buying. Um, so Wistawa is not buying things like buttons very significantly. She's not buying things like buckram, which is a stiffener for uh, men's coats and other items. No shoes, no hats. Uh, and the kinds of items that um, uh, Fonda's white customers were purchasing. Things that are being purchased with the idea of you buy all of your items that you're going to take to a tailor and have specific tailored garments make, made. And this results in uh, a very separated visual identity in these communities uh, along the frontier of early New York or what becomes New York. Um, this is an image of two women. Uh, the woman on the left, the Mohawk woman, is, so far as I know, the only image of uh, Haudenosaunee women made before 1800 uh, that's verifiably Haudenosaunee. There's a lot of images that are uh, kind of general images of Indigenous women, but this is the only one that's specifically Haudenosaunee. Uh, and then the woman on the right, this isn't a woman in New York. This is a, a depiction of a woman in the Netherlands, but it's fairly representative of what uh, white women in early New York were wearing. And there's a lot of parallels here. Uh, both of them have fairly short skirts. They're doing agricultural work, garden work, et cetera. They both have dark colored skirts, helps hide the dirt a little bit. Uh, light colored tops, uh, they're uh, short gowns, bed gowns, jackets, whatever that item on top is. Um, increasingly in the late 18th century were of light colors or pastels signifies femininity for both Haudenosaunee and white women. 
But there's also some really big differences here. Um, among the most significant, the shaping of their torsos. Uh, the woman on the left, the Mohawk woman, is probably not wearing stays underneath her bedgown or whatever that is. Uh, and even if both of these women bought their items from the same trader and they're the same materials, you can see things like linen, wool, calicos in what they're both wearing, there's no mistaking these women uh, for, for each other. They've created a very distinct separate visual identity in what they're wearing. Uh, so people are very aware of that. Like they, they see these things, they're interacting with their neighbors, uh, wearing these different items uh, on a daily basis. And they're aware of that significance. Uh, and that's part of the expression of sovereignty in the 18th century, that the Haudenosaunee uh, positioned themselves prior to the American Revolution, not as subjects to the British king, as most white people in New York would think of themselves as subjects of the British king, but as allies. And they express that in part through clothing, as we see here. So as the revolution approaches and finally boils over in 1776, these distinctions matter. They matter a lot. Um, my colleague at SUNY Binghamton, Rob Parkinson, uh, has argued in his book, The 13 Clocks, which I strongly recommend. It's a fairly, uh, light is not the right word, but it's a, it's a fairly brisk read about how people are thinking about uh, kind of the road to revolution in this period. How do people form an American identity? Uh, Parkinson has argued that the format of the declaration itself in 1776 tells us a lot about how people are thinking about gender in particular, as well as race. Uh, part of Parkinson's argument in the 13 clocks is to get 13 clocks to chime together as one, much of the discourse about the revolution and the road to the revolution in 74, 75, and 76 is about creating a white identity, and specifically a white masculine identity. And this is done in part through readings of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, so what we're looking at here is the preamble and then the beginning of the list of 27 grievances uh, in, the, in the Declaration. And the, uh, the 27 grievances of the Declaration escalate. Uh, they begin here with the King of England has refused to assent to laws. He's forbidden the governors to pass laws, et cetera, et cetera. But they escalate in their severity. And this, is, again, is part of Parkinson's argument. Um, and the last grievance of the Declaration of Independence and through its positioning and the way that it's read and experienced by people listening to the, these readings of the Declaration of Independence uh, is the, the grievance that the King of England has caused merciless Indian savages uh, to attack women and children on the frontiers. So thinking about gender and the safety particularly of white women is very much a part of what people are thinking about what the revolution is about. And that becomes a very central part uh, then of how the revolution itself is experienced, the war of the revolution. And in the early days of the revolution uh, in New York, people are thinking about the material part of this, uh, who is in, who is out, who is part of uh, what will become the nation. Uh, Peter Gansevoort, writing in 1778, said that Canada Harry is in the heart of our settlements, and it's abounding with every necessary, so it's remarked that the Indians live much better than most of the Mohawk River farmers, the white farmers. So people are thinking about what does this mean, uh, this separation of visual identity, as well as this uh, beginnings of anxiety about uh, a, a racial other having what's perceived as much better houses and much better farms in the Mohawk Valley. And this is especially significant given uh, kind of the land pressures and economic pressures uh, of early New York. Actually gonna go back to this one real briefly, sorry about that. Um, so Gansevoort is writing to Sullivan. He's also in conversation with Philip Schuyler, um, who will become part of the broader conversation about uh, courting the Haudenosaunee. Up until about 1777, the six nations of the Haudenosaunee, the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Tuscarora, and Seneca, uh, are largely neutral. But in 1777, 1778, that starts to change. Um, Philip Schuyler is particularly instrumental in this. Uh, during the winter of 1776, Philip Schuyler negotiates directly with Oneida women 
not with men, but with women, and that's very significant. Um, using Haudenosaunee diplomatic metaphors. Uh, Philip Schuyler had a farm plantation in the Saratoga region. He's very, very familiar with Haudenosaunee diplomatic metaphor, and that shows uh, in the the overtures, the diplomatic overtures that he makes to these Oneida women in 1776. Um, speaking with the Oneida, Philip Schuyler said that we sit under the same tree, our fathers are buried under the same ground, and we eat from the same dish. Uh, so he's using there very specifically Haudenosaunee diplomatic metaphor. Uh, the tree of peace is the tree under which all of the six nations uh, came together as the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Uh, and this language around sitting under the same tree of peace, that their fathers are buried under the same ground, and eating from the same dish or the dish with one spoon, these are all foundational metaphors that are part of the Haudenosaunee uh, creation story of the Confederacy. So Schuyler is very aware of what he's doing, the overtures that he's making. But he also, in that same negotiation, uh, made what I think is a veiled threat um, in trying to persuade the Oneida to ally with the Americans and leave their uh, historic alliance with the British. Philip Schuyler promised that if the um, that if the Oneida allied with the Americans, that they would be supplied with every necessary, that they wouldn't be asked to fight against their Haudenosaunee kin, again, a foundational part of uh, Haudenosaunee kind of philosophical thought that you can't fight against your brother or your your the members of the Confederacy. But he made this threat uh, that if the king's troop destroy us who are of the same blood with him or with themselves, uh, what can you who are Indians expect from them? So there's this failed threat of like both that Schuyler knows the diplomatic language, that he's familiar with the people in these communities, but also this threat of what can you who are Indians expect from them, of what is what are the possible outcomes here? So people are very much thinking about how to position themselves relative to one another. Uh, and this is the context in which uh, the violence of the American Revolution begins to escalate. Um, so in 1776, we have this broader thought throughout the nation or what becomes the nation uh, with the Declaration of Independence and thinking about white women's safety, that that's seen as uh, a kind of a central part of the call and the grievances of the revolution. We have this negotiation between Philip Schuyler, uh, I shouldn't be uh, Peter on there, but Philip, um, with the Oneida women in 1776. And then in 1777 through 79, we have a series of escalating uh, incidents in which the violence begins to step up against Haudenosaunee women. Uh, some of these I'm gonna talk about real briefly and a couple of these I'll go into more depth in a uh, slide or two. So in July of 1777, uh, some of you may be familiar with the murder of Jane McCree. It's memorialized in a very famous painting after uh, the American Revolution. Uh, Jane McCree is killed by uh, indigenous people who are allied with the British. And this story runs really quickly up and down the East Coast. Uh, and it's kind of part of, it's folded into this narrative of the Declaration of Independence about white women's vulnerability. Uh, again, thinking about the declaration as kind of this escalating list of grievances and Jane, the murder of Jane McCree is taken very much as proof of that. Uh, in August of 1777 with the Battle of Oriskany, um, uh, Molly Brandt and Esther Montour are two Haudenosaunee women. Molly Brandt is uh, Mohawk and Esther Montour is Seneca. There's rumors after Oriskany uh, that Molly Brandt and Esther Montour tortured to death and cannibalized American men who were taken prisoner at Oriskany. Uh, and again, this runs just up and down the East Coast, rumors, letters, et cetera. And I have to emphasize that this is absolutely false. Uh, for sure, Molly Brandt was not anywhere near Oriskany. Esther Montour, we don't know exactly where she was. She might have been present, but there's very, very little evidence uh, that she was present on the battlefield. And there's no evidence at Oriskany that uh, anybody was was cannibalized. So this is very much a gendered rumor about that Esther Montour may have been present, but in explaining her presence and explaining the presence of other indigenous women at this battle, uh, the kind of the way that Americans grapple with this, Haudenosaunee women are traditionally present uh, at, at battle as part of the support structure uh, of Haudenosaunee warriors, part of the way that Americans kind of grappled with this, rationalized it, 
was through these rumors of cannibalism, that these women are so monstrous that they this is, must be what they're there to do. And these rumors, together with the way that the Declaration of Independence positions uh, kind of the problem of Indianness alongside the problem of gender, uh, culminates with violence against Haudenosaunee women specifically. In November of 1777, um, Molly Brandt, who's the widow of Sir William Johnson, the former British uh, superintendent of Indian affairs, woke at about two or three in the morning to stones being thrown through her window uh, and her house was uh, invaded by the local committee of safety. The committee of safety we don't know what how many uh, men were involved in this. Uh, Jealous Fonda was appointed as a, a kind of investigator after the fact by Congress. And Fonda, as a Continental Army officer, took affidavits about what happened uh, during this Committee of Safety raid. And what happened, so far as we can tell from the affidavits that Fonda took, was, um, <laughs> excuse me, um, was so extensive that it was impossible for him to enumerate everything that happened. Uh, Molly Brandt's home at Kanajahari was not the only Indigenous home that was attacked. Many, Most of the other Indigenous homes uh, at Fort Hunter and Kanajahari were also attacked. Um, so significant, it was impossible for me to make an inventory of all the goods. Uh, I can't find out from any of them the hole that's missing. Um, and this was very much committed by neighbors. Um, the people in the neighborhood, sundry persons in our neighborhood made it their business to go out about plundering. They broke into these homes with faces painted black in the middle of the night, uh, very specifically to inflict terror. Uh, most of the Mohawk families at Fort Hunter and Canada Harry fled under in the middle of the night, literally with what they could carry. And during the course of the raid and in the days that followed, um, some of these committee of, American Committee of Safety raiders specifically dug up recently buried Mohawk graves uh, and exhumed from those graves things like blankets and coats that had been purchased, created for the Indian trade and purchased from in, uh, traders like Jealous Fonda. These thefts were also extremely intimate, uh, not only the grave robbing and desecration, but also um, the intimacy of just the terror of these home invasions in the middle of the night. Uh, but then many members of the Committee of Safety uh, were seen to take women, specifically women's clothing from these homes and give it to their wives and daughters to wear in the months and days uh, following the Committee of Safety raids. Uh, the leader of the Committee of Safety raid against Molly Brandt's home in particular, Peter Digert, uh, Fonda collected several affidavits that his wife's and, wife and daughters were seen wearing Molly Brandt's silk gowns. So there's a lot of things going on there. Um, the intimacy of the thefts, the kind of immediacy of the terror going into a neighbor's home in the middle of the night, uh, as well as those specific symbols, uh, those sim clothing symbols, um, that these communities are very familiar with how uh, Haudenosaunee people are constructing themselves as as allied, separate, sovereign through their clothing, like that image that I showed you earlier, and then giving those items to uh, the wives and daughters of, uh, of the Committee of Safety members that committed the raid. So on a symbolic level, um, or on a practical level, it's about pushing people literally out of their homes. On a symbolic level, uh, it's about taking away those symbols and claims to autonomy, sovereignty, and distinction, as well as protection. Um, the blankets and coats that Mohawk men wore were often worn at diplomatic conferences uh, and in diplomatic connection with uh, British allies specifically. So there's a lot of symbolic layers going on in these thefts. So this initial raid um, is in uh, the fall of 1777, pushes the Mohawk. Uh, Pretty much out of the Mohawk Valley. Uh, Mohawk families don't return to the Mohawk Valley during the course of the war. Uh, and in as the war continues, 1778 to 1779, uh, Oneida women uh, bring food and moccasins and other clothing item to Washington and at Valley Forge. And there's this tension in how Americans write about Haudenosaunee women, because on the one hand, they're aware of the service that um, specifically Oneida women 
uh, performed in bringing relief to Valley Forge, but also these rumors that we talked about earlier with um, of Molly Brandt and Esther Montour's behavior and the murder of Jane McCree and all of these things going on. And this culminates in, um, in the Sullivan-Clinton campaign of 1779. Um, the Sullivan-Clinton campaign is kind of the, the last push against uh, many of these communities that had remained neutral. Um, after 1777, the Mohawk formally allied for the most part with the British, the Oneida and the Tuscarora are allied with the Americans, uh, but the Cayuga, Onondaga, and Seneca are uh, still neutral or profess neutrality, but that's not trusted by the Americans for many of the reasons that we've talked about uh, so far. And the Sullivan campaign in 1779 uh, was to that date the largest and most expensive military campaign of the war. Um, it was seen as kind of the what would make the definitive turning point at that point in the war. And much like the um, the Mohawk Valley raids against Molly Brandt's home in 1777, this was specifically designed to inflict terror. Uh, and that was the gendered aspect of inflicting terror was very much on the minds uh, of those who designed this campaign. Um, this is Washington, George Washington's orders specifically to John Sullivan, one of the commanders of the campaign, uh, that the immediate objects are the total destruction and devastation. You will not by any means listen to overtures of peace before their total ruin is effected. Uh, Philip Schuyler, in a separate order to Sullivan and Clinton, gave specific orders that women and children were to be sought out as hostages uh, because they were seen as inflicting, uh, here as uh, Washington says, the maximum terror with which the severity of the chastisement they will receive, uh, that specifically taking women and children hostage was part of that. <laughs> and the Sullivan campaign, um, in both the scholarship and as it was being prosecuted during the war, uh, was dismissed in many by many people as a war against vegetables. Uh, John Sullivan at one point himself calls, calls this campaign that, but it's nothing but a war against vegetables. Uh, because for the most part, during the campaign itself, they're unsuccessful. Um, they, the Sullivan-Clinton campaign takes less than 100 captives, uh, less than 100 hostages, and they mostly burn cornfields and orchards and homes. In its later effects, this will be very devastating, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but this, the soldiers on campaign have very mixed feelings about this. Um, they had thought, for the most part, that they were going to be like marching in in battle, uh, and what they end up doing is burning homes and fields, like the ones pictured here. This is a recreation out at Historic Ganondigan. And this burning of, of homes and fields, uh, it has gendered significance for both Haudenosaunee and Americans. For Haudenosaunee people, women are the people who own land and make decisions about land in Haudenosaunee traditional governance. Uh, so an attack on land, an attack on cornfields and orchards specifically is an attack against both women's like physical property as well as women's traditional claims to uh, a role in governance and a role in military decisions. Clan matrons in Haudenosaunee governance, if they uh, disagree with the decision to go to war, deny the war parties food. They deny the war parties the ability to take stores uh, or supplies from, from communal longhouse stores, and it effectually, it, it effectually uh, vetoes uh, the decision to go to war. So there's a lot of power there, both symbolic and practical. Americans also, uh, American soldiers, continental soldiers also understood this in gendered terms. Um, the title here, Homes of Contentment, again, thinking about the, the Declaration of Independence, the American Revolution is thought about very much in terms of gender. Whose safety, uh, who, like gender confers a sense of safety, that women are supposed to not be participants in this war. They do, uh, in many ways, end up experiencing the war, both indigenous, black, and, uh, and settler women. But in the conceptualization of the war, uh, women are supposed to be kind of safe from all of this. Uh, and in writing about the, the prosecution of the Sullivan campaign, <laughs> excuse me, you can see continental soldiers kind of grappling with this. Uh, one soldier uh, at one point, as they sat 
he said that he sat there uh, watching these long houses and fields burn so that I really feel bad what uh, destroying what were homes of contentment. Uh, so thinking about the home as a symbol, these men understood uh, in their own terms that home was supposed to be this kind of gendered space of safety. Um, and you see this also kind of as a tension in what, how these uh, soldiers describe the landscape of Haudenosaunee territories. As I mentioned earlier, this is one of the first time that settlers enter many of these territories. Uh, and the descriptions are kind of, there's this tension between the familiarity and the unfamiliarity that uh, these continental soldiers perceive. Uh, that they initially, in the early days of the campaign, had expected kind of a more unfamiliar landscape. But what they see is homes where things like prayer books, milk basins, feather beds, horses and pigs had been abandoned. And they're kind of baffled by the familiarity of it. They describe these things as things that their sisters or their wives uh, might have owned or left, and they kind of are processing this. Um, and they also kind of describe the like the size of the melons. This is in uh, many of these homes are burned in like August and September around harvest time. Stalks of corn 10 feet high, melons uh, as big as two men's heads. They sat up until 2 a.m. eating, uh, feasting like you wouldn't believe, one man writes. And it's this real tension around like, what are we doing here? And what have, what have we done in burning this? Uh, and over the course of the campaign, you can start to see them rationalize this, what they're doing. Um, things, the size of the cornfields that Haudenosaunee women had cultivated are really hard to overstate uh, by best estimates, best recent estimates. There's something like millions upon millions of bushels of corn, thousands of acres of corn burned. And those fields take a long time to establish uh, and create uh, when you're using hand tools. Um, orchards were burned that were decades old, and that's all women's work in Haudenosaunee territory, but uh, these uh, continental soldiers write about this as they were paid by the British to cultivate this so that they could prosecute the war against us. They were paid by the British to cultivate this corn to supply the British. Um, you also see a recirculation of the rumors about Esther Brandt, uh, or uh, Molly Brandt and Esther Montour. And this is the point where the language about it's a war against vegetables comes in because they're in part rationalizing what's happening. <laughs> and this happens concurrently um, with the sexual assault of Haudenosaunee women. Um, at, at one town, Chemung, uh, as the soldiers are leaving the town and that leaving the town is significant, uh, the nude body of a young Haudenosaunee woman was found. Uh, she had been murdered, and the, the the one description that we have of this is unclear, but the presumption is that she had been sexually assaulted. Uh, and in the way that both the enlisted men and the uh, officers on the Sullivan campaign grapple with this, they argue the implication here in this uh, letter by James Clinton, one of the commanders of the campaign, is that an indigenous person must have done this, that it couldn't have been a continental soldier, um, that, that there's kind of this tension around what, what is possible, um, that he has very little apprehension that any of the soldiers will forget their character as to attempt a crime on uh, Indian women who might fall into their hands. It will be well to take measures to prevent such a stain on our army. So there's this, some tension around this uh, about how continental soldiers are actually going to be treating indigenous women. Uh, this is the only direct American continental discussion of this sexual assault. There's some letters back and forth between Clinton and Sullivan. Um, but this is the only this is the only incident that continental soldiers discuss. After the war, there's implication that this was much more widespread. Uh, one Onondaga speaker for the women in a post-war treaty conference, made the accusation that uh, continental soldiers had killed elderly women and elderly men, but carried off scores of younger women for the use of their soldiers, uh, the Onondaga speaker said. So Americans are very reluctant to discuss this during the war, and they kind of rationalize this in the same breath uh, as dismissing this campaign as a war against women, whereas Haudenosaunee speakers are much more frank that this was a much more widespread issue. 
The Sullivan Clinton campaign ultimately uh, destroyed about 40 settlements in Haudenosaunee territory. This is a, a map of the path of the uh, of the Sullivan Clinton campaign. And although its direct impacts uh, during that late summer, early fall of 1779 were fairly limited, they, the Sullivan Clinton campaign ultimately did not succeed in taking as many captives as they hoped to. Um, the best estimate, as I said, less than 100, very few casualties similarly inflicted. Um, they burned potentially millions of bushels of corn, hundreds of uh, like thousands upon thousands of acres of fields and orchards. Uh, and this winter of 1779 that followed uh, into 1780 and then the following winter of 1781, were absolutely brutal for the Haudenosaunee refugees. Um, there were, by some estimates, several thousand refugees at British Niagara, near what's now uh, Buffalo. And many of those refugees packed into crowded conditions, underfed by the British, uh, exposed to the cold. Many of them died there at Niagara as a consequence of the Sullivan Clinton campaign. Um, so you see in just this process of the campaign that gender is a very central component of uh, how Americans in Haudenosaunee are thinking about the war, how they think about the prosecution of campaigns like this, uh, and the experience of it. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, this all is the reason that many scholars think of the American Revolution as kind of the end point for Haudenosaunee sovereignty, because it is a major crisis point in Haudenosaunee sovereignty. Uh, during the course of the war, Many of these communities suffer very significant impacts, and I don't want to downplay that in any way. But they come back after the war. Um, Haudenosaunee women are not always very visible in the archival record, um, like many women, frankly. Um, but Haudenosaunee women specifically, um, as part of kind of the gender of diplomacy in Haudenosaunee diplomacy, uh, women don't speak at treaty conferences, so they are often in European records of these cross-cultural interactions. They don't show up, and that changes really dramatically post-war. Um, after the American Revolution, in the, the treaty conferences, kind of settling the peace after the revolution, Americans try really specifically to exclude Haudenosaunee women. Uh, one of the American commissioners of Indian Affairs complains very bitterly that um, hundreds of women show up to this treaty conference, and he complains that he has to feed uh, these Haudenosaunee women, children, and horses besides, that those are all kind of grouped together, and he's just very bitter about this because it adds to this. It, it's a large expense in the early days of the, uh, the American nation. There's not a lot of money to go around. <laughs> uh, and women become more visible as part of an assertion of Haudenosaunee sovereignty. Uh, and here, Seneca Billy is a Seneca speaker for the women. Uh, speaker for the women is a uh, a male speaker who's specifically appointed to speak on behalf of the clan matrons of a nation. Uh, and this quote, I think, encapsulates a lot of this um, the, about why these women show up so much more significantly after the revolution. Um, for this reason that President George Washington might also hear from us, that he might not know that the women have been at the council fire to hear what has been done. And for this reason, that we are the persons who supported the country and that we do this, that he might know that the women are yet alive. For we suppose he does not know that the women attended treaties. So like a lot of passive aggressive there, um, but also just like, it's this pushback very specifically against, you cannot exclude us. We are part of this nation uh, and we are part of kind of what will make this work. And you see this again and again in the post-war period through the 19th century. So the American Revolution is in many ways a kind of crisis for Haudenosaunee sovereignty, and it results in this very restricted, uh, much smaller land base that we saw in that 2020 map of Haudenosaunee territories. But at the same time, uh, it, Haudenosaunee women are still present very much and pushing back against this narrative and continue to do so to this day in 2023. So I'll end there. I just want to, um, before I pull down the slides, uh, if you bring up the slides, these are accessible and will remain accessible, um, mavekane.net slash brookside. If anybody's interested in this, um, I've put up a few links. The first three are two organizations that deal with some of these issues in the present. 
Um, indigenous women face much higher rates of sexual assault and murder and domestic violence than uh, women of other races. The National Indigenous Women's Resource Center um, is an advocacy organization for some for those issues. Uh, and then the other uh, links there are links to books and other resources that might be of interest if you're here tonight at this talk. Um, and some of those are Amazon links. They're not affiliate links. I don't make any money up, off of this. This is just uh, resources that I recommend. Uh, and finally, because my publisher tells me to plug this, um, my book is available for sale, Shirts Powdered Red. There's a discount code there. Um, and it's also available for free to read online, I believe, until the end of May. And I'll drop a link for that uh, in the chat. So thank you very much. Please do reach out on Twitter or by email. And I'm happy to chat uh, in the Q&A here. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kane, for sharing all of that information. And uh, as you said, uh, that link um, will take you to uh, the slides and uh, all those other links you mentioned. Uh, we have worked uh, with uh, Kay Olin in the past uh, for our Native New York program, and so it's great to see her name come up um, in your list of resources as well. Um, so if anyone does have any questions, um, please feel free to write those into the chat um, and uh, we can uh, discuss those further. Um, while we wait to see if there's any questions that come in, one sort of uh, thing I've always pondered was, um, especially in your studies of um, Molly Brandt and uh, the Johnson family and all of that, um, do you have any thoughts on how things might have been different with the revolution if Sir William uh, Johnson had survived after um, 1774? Um, I believe it was July 74 that he died. Um, how do you think things could have gone differently if he had lived longer? Yeah, yeah, my guy Bill Johnson. Um, I like I think about this one a lot too. Um, I I suspect that um, most of the Six Nations probably would have um, would have come out for the in British alliance much more strongly and much earlier. But I think that the Oneida at least probably would have broken um, because the Oneida alliance was coming. It, the the Oneida alliance with the Americans was coming in large part from dissatisfaction with William Johnson. Um, and he might have been able to carry that off. He carried Oneida alliance with the British for, you know, decades prior. Um, but the Oneida were pretty unhappy with Johnson for several decades, um, or uh, for several years before his death anyway. So I, I think that even if he had been able to carry the rest of the Six Nations, the Oneida might have split. Um, what was the population of New York Native Americans before and after the revolution? There's not a lot of great estimates. That's a good question. Um, the best estimates that I've seen is about for for Haudenosaunee specifically. This is the Six Nations um, that they're about probably sixty thousand before the war, maybe fifty thousand after the war, because there's a number of epidemics that go through uh, in the 1780s, like at Niagara and uh, some of the other communities. For other communities like the Mahicanoc and Muncie and Lenape, I don't know those numbers. They were never that large to begin with, but the Haudenosaunee is around 50 to 60,000. Oh, Sullivan and Clinton, yeah. Um, I believe George Clinton is the Clinton. Uh, Sullivan is John Sullivan. I always get my Clintons mixed up. Um, is the Gansevoort area named after Peter, Peter Gansevoort or his family relations? I don't actually know. <laughs> um, I think... I think that it was a family member and not that Peter Gansport, but I couldn't swear to it. There's a lot of Gansports in, in this area, as many of you know. Sarah, um, how did I come to research this topic? Um, so when I set out uh, to do my dissertation, this is uh, the book that I was talking about, uh, it was started as a dissertation project. Um, I was very interested in um, 
I had volunteered at museums. I My first job in high school was as a seamstress uh, sewing clothing for our costume site interpreters. Um, and we did some research on like, what are people wearing? What does that mean, et cetera? Um, and I was frustrated throughout that entire process of like, there's relatively good documentation of what white women were wearing um, and why. There's less great documentation for enslaved and free black women. But a lot of, at least when I was starting this project in um, uh, in you know the, the early mid 2000s, there was not a lot of great information about indigenous women's uh, clothing or meanings or what it meant to them. There's a lot of writing and academic scholarship about like what, what images of indigenous people meant to white people. Like that's a, a pretty significant area of scholarship. Um, so when I started the dissertation project, I thought I was going to write a book about uh, comparing white women, free and enslaved black and indigenous women's use of clothing to think about race broadly. And there's some of that still there. Um, I think clothing, when you're thinking about clothing, material, culture, objects, is a really good lens to look at the lives of people who aren't writing about themselves. Um, and that's like the vast majority of people in early America. Um, but I, I just was so frustrated with the lack of documentation, both historical and scholarly, about indigenous women's lives that I decided to focus on that. Um, I was told at the beginning of the project that I wouldn't find anything on indigenous people's lives, what they were buying, what they were wearing, and why. Uh, and I ended up finding so much that it, it took a, frankly, too long book project to work through all of it. Um, so I think that that speaks to, like, if if people think that there's nothing there, they won't find anything. But if you look for a documentation of people's lives beyond kind of um, the well-documented things, that there is quite a lot there. Uh, so thank you, Sarah, for that question. Um, there's a question, is it possible that accounts of American women suffering at Wyoming and Cherry Valley led to some of the justification of the Clinton-Sullivan campaign? Yes, I do think that that's a contributing factor as well. So um, Cherry Valley and Wyoming are in 78, uh, and the, that's when the Sullivan Clinton campaign is being planned and then it's executed in the late fall of 79. Um, and yeah, I, I, I can't remember if I put that on my timeline slide or not, but yeah, I think that's a contributing factor as well, along with Jay McCree and other, uh, other events. Um, Isabel asks, where is my research taking me now? Um, so I have kind of, I have tenure so I can do what I want. <laughs> um, I have kind of two projects that are running in sort of separate tracks. Um, one is a kind of kind of obscure project. Um, if you take something like a baptismal register, like uh, somebody in the chat mentioned Skohari, if you take something like the baptismal register for the Skohari Lutheran Church uh, in the 1740s or whenever it starts, and you have a parent, uh, a mother and a father, and a godmother and a godfather, and you make connections between those. Uh, there's a computational method called social network analysis. You can basically draw a network of those people and say like, okay, so this person has a lot of connections. They're fairly influential. How does that change over time? What does that mean? Um, and I'm interested in that project. This is like Skohari Lutheran is one example, but you find these kinds of registers all across uh, early America, like everywhere. And the question that I'm trying to answer with that project is, again, people who aren't leaving documentation about their own lives, what are their lives like? What's the role of women in those communities? Um, because there's a lot of women who show up in those communities that you find literally no mention of anywhere else. Um, but there's specifically women become much more um, central in these networks. Like they have a, a lot more connections in these networks leading up to the American Revolution. And I think that that speaks to how women's lives were changing uh, in the years leading to the revolution. Um, the other project that I have running on a separate track is um, these questions about how people construct themselves, how people construct identity has kind of led me to a project about how reenactors and living history practitioners uh, kind of think about the presentation of the revolution. And we're coming up to the 250th of the revolution. So I think that's especially important of like, how do people think about this? How is it being presented? How do we make a narrative about what America is now by thinking about what America was then? But thank you. Um, let's see, 
What do I think is the biggest misconception Americans have about the revolution and its relationship to the Haudenosaunee people? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I guess in um, in New York, this is perhaps less salient, um, but in general, like that point I kept kind of gesturing to of the American Revolution as an endpoint for Indigenous history, I find is really common, um, just kind of across the board, like people don't think of the continuing Indigenous presence uh, past either the revolution or like the period of removal in 1830. I think that's a little less the case in New York, because like if you drive west on 90 or 87 or whichever one that is, you drive through Seneca territory and like the signs are there now. Um, but New York is really strange in a lot of ways uh, in the history of like the, the original 13 colonies. Um, New York is the only state of the original 13 that has a continuous indigenous reservation presence. Um, there are reservations in other of the original 13 colonies that have been reestablished in the 20th century, but New York is the only one where those reservations have always been there. Um, and that's in part, I think, because of the continuing kind of political, diplomatic, military significance of the Haudenosaunee. Um, so I guess like New York more specifically, people have kind of this misconception that like treaty rights are special rights, that like the ability to, uh, like the right of Haudenosaunee reservations now in New York to sell gas without New, New York state sales tax, to sell cigarettes and things on reservations uh, without New York tax uh, is some kind of special or odd right, but it's treaty guaranteed. It has the same force of weight as the American Constitution. Any treaty that the United States enters into has the, the same force of law as the Constitution. Um, and those are foundational. Like that's part of the foundational piece that the United States made to become a nation. Um, so I think that that gets kind of lost sometimes in like New York wants that tax revenue. Like that's that's important to New York State, but that ignores kind of what the foundational principles were that created the nation, that like those treaties have the force of constitutional law. So thank you. All right. If we have any other questions come in in the next couple of moments, great. But uh, um, I think this was fascinating and uh, definitely I learned a lot. And this has been a wonderful opportunity uh, to expand understanding of this era, this conflict and all of that. So I want to thank you very much for being here this evening. And also thank you to all of our participants in the audience as well. Thank you for being here and for your excellent questions. So. Yeah, thank you all so much for coming. I really, uh, really, really appreciated all the questions. All right. So it looks like we are pretty well set. And so I want to, I, I'll get this uh, turned off in a moment. But again, thank you all for being here. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks again, Anne, for organizing and everything. It was a great night. No problem. Bye-bye.